In a moment, we'll explore the regular polytopes, the most symmetric flat-sided shapes in four or more dimensions. Understanding the 4D polytopes lends itself to multiple neat approaches, each of which is guaranteed to refine your outlook on the 4D world. Especially stunning is 4D Toys, an entire app dedicated to wrapping your mind, or pulling it into, the fourth dimension. What I want to spotlight, though, is a lesser-known yet beautiful way to construct 4D polytopes by arranging platonic solids around polyhedral scaffolds. My aim is to build an intuitive feel for these shapes, convincing you, and even your cat, to join the 4D club. But first, a story. Around 360 BC, the Greek philosopher Plato catalogued the five most symmetric 3D polyhedra in a book called Timaeus. Since Plato was also a celebrity, the polyhedra became known as platonic solids, even though he didn't discover them first. Now, imagine your Plato composing your famous book, when suddenly the skies part and the goddess Athena descends to you from the ether. She reveals that the solids you're about to describe will forever bear your name. Yippee! Athena offers you a choice. You may change how many dimensions our world has, which might increase the number of regular shapes. As a true celebrity, you want as many things as possible to be named after you, so you greedily explore your options. You find infinite regular polygons in two dimensions, but this choice is a little flat to your taste. 3D has five symmetric shapes, 4D has six, and you think you've spotted a pattern. You expect the number of regular polytopes to increase with dimension. After all, more dimensions mean more space for variation. Not at all. Everywhere else you look, you find an underwhelming three polytopes. A bit disgruntled, you tell Athena you've chosen 4D, and she disappears in a puff of chalk dust. After taking a stroll through the strange new world, you sit down to document the regular 4D polytopes in your manuscript. Good grief! You know nothing about these shapes. Unless you figure out what they are, some other big shot like your student Aristotle will snatch your fame, and your name might be lost to the ages. Before venturing into the fourth dimension, let's remind ourselves of the 3D platonic solids. Feel free to skip this section if you're familiar with their construction. What makes these polyhedra so regular? Given an extra symmetric shape, you shouldn't be able to distinguish any of its vertices, edges, or faces. To ensure this, we make platonic solids out of identical regular polygons, with the same number meeting at each vertex. Consider our building blocks. The equilateral triangle, the square, the regular pentagon, hexagon, and so on. Although there is no end to our options, only a few of them assemble into polyhedra. Can you see why? If a platonic solid exists, we should be able to design a flat version of its vertex that folds up into 3D space. Two polygons would snap flat on their own, so every respectable vertex has at least three faces. For example, try arranging equilateral triangles around another equilateral triangle. Lift them from the plane to connect the edges, and you get a vertex of a tetrahedron. In fact, you'll get an entire tetrahedron just by adding a face. What else can we arrange around an equilateral triangle? Three squares leave some wiggle room, which you can use to invent a new vertex. Two of these are enough to build a cube. Swap out the squares for pentagons and eliminate the gaps with a gentle lift. Continue to make a magnificent dodecahedron. What about hexagons? Alas, no wiggle room. But this perfect fit lets them tile the plane. Think Catan, Graphite, and Chicken Wire. The other polygons don't fit at all in Euclidean space, so it's time to change our foundation. Equilateral triangles around a square make an octahedron, our fourth success so far. Four squares, like three hexagons, fit snugly and generate graph paper. The pinnacle of humanity, if you ask me. Pentagons and other polygons are hopeless, so let's add an extra side to our template. Five equilateral triangles lift ever so slightly into the vertex of an icosahedron. You might have noticed that the arrangements with the least wiggle room produce the most complex polyhedra. No wonder. The less space we must eliminate, the flatter our vertex, the more vertices we need to loop all the way around. Hold on to this insight. It might carry over to the fourth dimension. Returning to our casework, squares and polygons with more sides don't fit around a pentagon, so we move on to a hexagonal template. Six triangles are a perfect fit, forming the last of the three regular tilings. At this point, increasing the number of sides of either the base or the faces is bound to create overlaps. So, we found all the 3D platonic solids. The cardboard templates we've used to arrange the faces are known as vertex figures. 
Can you find them on an assembled polyhedron? Starting with one of our solids, Mark points one unit away from a particular vertex along every edge it's connected to. Make a slice through the marked points, and you'll recover the vertex figure. In this case, the equilateral triangle we started with. If the concept of a vertex figure carried over to other dimensions, it could be our key to grappling with regular polytopes. Before we get to that, though, let's sort out what a polytope is, and which properties would make it regular. 1D segments arrange into 2D polygons, which assemble into 3D polyhedra, which, given the pattern, should snap into 4D polytopes somewhere beyond our grasp. Mm -hmm. Thus, we can characterize a 4D polytope as a bounded mosaic of snugly fitting polyhedra that fold into the fourth dimension. Generally, a polytope in n dimensions is a bounded object made of snugly fitting n-1 dimensional polytopes curving into the nth dimension. By snugly fitting, I mean that the outer surface shouldn't have any holes or boundaries. This is why a ring of five squares on its own is not a polyhedron. Are you wincing and demanding more rigor? Sorry, but strictly defining a polytope could take up a whole video, and an intuitive understanding goes a long way. We haven't even defined a polyhedron here, and for a good reason. No, seriously. If you don't believe me, check out Branka Grunbaum's 30-page paper titled Are Your Polyhedra the Same as My Polyhedra? Anyway, what makes a polytope regular? Platonic solids consist of congruent regular polygons with the same number of polygons per vertex. Moreover, the vertex figures of platonic solids, or the cardboard templates we've been using, are also congruent regular polygons. This definition extends nicely to higher dimensions. An n-dimensional polytope is regular if and only if all its n-1-dimensional faces are regular and congruent, and all its n-1-dimensional vertex figures are regular and congruent. Cheer up, Plato! With this, we have a recipe for building the regular polytopes. Now, instead of infinitely many regular polygons, we will use the five platonic solids as both our building blocks and our scaffolds. To simplify the casework, let's arrange our platonic solids from the pointiest to the flattest vertices. There's an algebraic method to calculate 3D angles precisely, but you can make a rough estimate from the number of vertices each solid has. The more steps are needed to wrap around an entire sphere, the smaller these steps should be. Simply put, more means flatter in the case of vertices. Starting from the tetrahedron on the very left, we'll have the octahedron, the cube, then the icosahedron, and finally the dodecahedron, the roundest of all. Let's begin with the tetrahedral scaffold, and test out building blocks from left to right. We can surround our vertex with four tetrahedra, leaving lots of space between the blocks. Like earlier in the plane, this spatial wiggle room enables us to fold the vertex into the next dimension. That's how we get the regular pentachoron also known as the hypertetrahedron, four simplex, and pentatope. It is often called a five cell because of its five tetrahedral faces. What if we try fitting octahedra? The vertices seem sharp enough, but something is fishy. Zoom in on a single dent of our scaffold. Inside, three planes converge at a central point. For a vertex to fit here, it must be surrounded by three faces, but octahedral vertices are surrounded by four. This new dent shape criterion is worth generalizing since it will help us rule out many vertex arrangements. The shape of the scaffold's faces must match the vertex figure of the building block, or the two won't align. In our case, the triangular faces of the tetrahedron don't match the octahedron's square vertices. So much for the octahedron. The cube immediately seems more promising. Indeed, four cubes loosely fill the dents, forming the vertex of the famed tesseract or hypercube. This creature has eight cubical cells and is the natural extension of a cube in four dimensions. What about icosahedra? No shot. Its vertex figures are pentagons, not triangles. On the other hand, four dodecahedra neatly fill the dents, leaving only a sliver of space. This near-perfect fit produces a monster of 120 dodecahedra, known as the 120 cell, hyperdodecahedron, or hecatonicosachoron, if you like long names. This arrangement might remind you of pentagons squeezed around a triangle. Once again, the resulting structure owes its complexity to the scarcity of wiggle room. With three polytopes under your belt, you're ready to try an octahedral scaffold. The dents are still triangular, so we'll consider tetrahedra, cubes, and dodecahedra. Eight tetrahedra fit effortlessly, and fold into 4D to form a vertex of a hexadecachoron, or hex for short. Some call it the 16 cell. You know why by this point. 
What about eight cubes? If you've seen a Rubik's cube, you know these fit perfectly and make an unexciting lattice. And since cube vertices are already too flat, we don't need to check dodecahedra. Time to switch scaffolds. Which of the platonic solids might fit into a square dent? As the sole candidate with four faces at a vertex, the octahedron is our only option. To be sure, eight octahedra form a valid vertex, the vertex of a 24 cell. You can call it an octaplex, icosatetrachoron, or ico for short. Now consider an icosahedral scaffold. Let's try filling this triangular concavity with a tetrahedron. Voila! With barely any space left for folding, 20 of these tetrahedra generate the vertex of a true leviathan. Lo and behold, the hexacosicoron, a giant made of 600 tetrahedral cells. Take a moment to absorb its intricacy. That's it. Since eight cubes already leave no wiggle room, we shouldn't hope to stuff 20 cubes or let alone 20 dodecahedra around a vertex. At this point, the dodecahedron is our only unchecked vertex figure. I leave it to you to verify this scaffold doesn't produce any valid polytopes. With a bit of squeezing and squishing, we've managed to find all six regular polytopes in four dimensions. Here are their 3D projections in full glory, borrowed from Wikipedia just for you. Pat yourself on the back! Except now, your name probably isn't Plato, but rather Alicia Boulstadt, who classified the six regular polytopes at the turn of the 20th century, without a formal education. Everything suggests she could visualize how things worked in 4D. I mean, she even built cross-sections of the polytopes with nothing but glue and cardboard. Sorry, Plato. <sighs> if you'd like a convenient way to list your discoveries in your book, you might turn to the work of Ludwig Schlafly, born over 2,000 years in the future. Schlafly suggested a recursive labeling method for regular polygons, polyhedra, and n-dimensional polytopes. For polygons, the Schlafly symbol is just the number of sides. For polyhedra, it has two values. The Schlafly symbol of the solid's faces followed by the number of faces at each vertex. So Schlafly would label a dodecahedron as 5-3 since its vertices each have three faces with five sides. A tetrahedron, which is triangles all around, would be denoted 3-3. In 4D, the Schlafly symbol consists of three values, made by joining the symbol of the building block with the symbol of the vertex figure. How would you label a hyperdodecahedron? As a reminder, we built it by fitting dodecahedral blocks into a tetrahedral scaffold. Combining the symbols of these polyhedra yields 5, 3, 3. But you might ask, what if the two symbols don't agree on the middle value? In the first symbol, this number represents how many faces meet at each vertex, or the vertex figure of the building block. In the second, it describes the shape of the scaffold's dents. Why should these two agree? Remember the dent shape criterion from before. The vertex figure has to match the number of sides in the concavity for the building block to fit into the scaffold. Schlafly's method takes advantage of this property by fusing the two symbols in the middle. This method extends to regular polytopes in five or more dimensions. In general, the Schlafly symbol of an n-dimensional polytope is a sequence of n-1 values. Removing the last number from the sequence produces the symbol of the building blocks, while removing the first one leaves the symbol of the vertex figures. For more practice with Schlafly symbols, try deriving them for the remaining five polytopes, and I'll reveal them in three, two, one, there. Now that we've constructed and labeled the polytopes, our job is done, right? But hold on. The meticulous among you might ask, how do we know each polytope actually folds up somewhere in the fourth dimension? If you're already in 4D, you can check whether all the polytopes exist just by building them. But if you're stuck in 3D like me, you'll need a more elaborate argument to prove our constructions check out. Following the theme of this video so far, let's step down a dimension and ask the same question about platonic solids. How can I tell the icosahedron really exists if I'm too lazy to glue 20 pieces of cardboard together? Suppose all I know is that five equilateral triangles make a neat curvy cap when joined around a point. Is this enough to justify the existence of a regular polyhedron? Well, imagine you have a sphere and some triangular patches of a variable size. Six very small equilateral triangles will almost fit around a vertex, as will four very large ones. By continuity, five patches of an intermediate size should snap together without gaps or overlaps. You cover the sphere with these intermediate triangles, making sure five corners meet at every vertex. 
If there is no such thing as an icosahedron, there will be a spot where the patches don't match up. Say that's the case, and extend the quilt of triangles in all directions so that it wraps round and round the sphere. In principle, you could extend it indefinitely, given an infinite supply of patches. Now, mark two points on your multilayer quilt, one right above the other. Since the quilt is one connected surface, there is a path joining the marked points that only crosses between adjacent patches. Let's follow this path with a piece of string, looping it from one marked point to the other. Here's the magical bit. As you start pulling on the loose ends, the loop begins to tighten. It's crucial to ensure the string shifts gradually, every fragment scooching from one patch to the next. The loop never gets stuck since our quilt extends in all directions. Can you guess the plot twist? Eventually, the loop tightens to a point. Which, you might wonder, the top or the bottom? Actually, both. Shrinking the loop shows that our start and end points must have been the same. Thus, our quilt can't have more than one layer. Moreover, the corners of all its patches form the vertices of an icosahedron, since five triangles connect at each corner. Why would this work in higher dimensions? In 4D, we have a hypersphere in place of a sphere and a hyperquilt made of polyhedral patches, though our path remains one-dimensional. Intuitively, adding a dimension shouldn't prevent us from tightening the loop. But let's apply some reasoning. Just like the equator of a sphere is a circle, the equator of a 4D hypersphere is a regular sphere. Choose a great circle passing through the two overlapping points. In 4D, this is a sphere with some uneven quilt on top, which is all you need to draw and tighten your loop. The idea extends inductively up through dimensions. Given an n-sphere and a point of overlap, you can restrict your path to an n-1 sphere slice passing through that point. Now, we have confidence that each of our vertex constructions amounts to a polytope in 4D. To test this argument, check why it fails in two dimensions. Otherwise, we would have regular polygons with every angle. Many thanks to the math wizard Drake Thomas for showing me this proof in the preceding construction. If you're wondering about polytopes in dimensions 5 and up, this scene is a bit dreary. Meet the trio, the n-simplex, n-cube, and n-orthoplex. The n-simplex is made by adding a vertex equidistant from all the others in every subsequent dimension. Starting with a point, we produce a segment, an equilateral triangle, a tetrahedron, a 5-cell, and so on. To get an n-cube from an n-1 cube, copy all the points one unit away in the new dimension. That's how a square becomes a cube, and a cube becomes a hypercube. We form an n-orthoplex by adding two points to the n-1 orthoplex, one unit above and below in the new dimension. Starting with a segment, we can build a square, an octahedron, a 16-cell, and so on. Please tell me if you know exactly what makes four dimensions stand out. For those of you still on the fence, here are some extra reasons 4D is the place to be. By the way, I've left a slew of links in the description with much more detail about the ideas covered here. So long, and see you in the fourth dimension!